And right off the bat, let's go over to my first guest to uh, talk about some of the biggest stories of the day with social policy analyst and writer, uh, Dr. Rakib Essan. Uh, hello, Rakib. Morning, Kevin. How are you? I'm very, very well. Uh, I don't expect you to be an expert on the television industry, uh, but uh, Russell Brand obviously dominating all the headlines. And I think what we're talking about, bearing in mind that he denies all wrongdoing, said all the sex he ever mm. had was consensual, but we're talking about a sort of culture that certainly existed in the television industry in this country back in the noughties, uh, where it's almost a case of goodness knows anything goes. Now, I've been saying all day, you know, people go, oh, did Russell Brand, did he behave terribly while he was hosting Big Brother's Big Mouse Mouth? Well, he says he didn't. He says uh, that everything he did was perfectly legal. Uh, but think about this, Rakib. Think about the programme, which they're bringing back, of course, this is what Big Brother was then. I know about this. I covered it intricately. I went to the Big Brother house many times. I appeared on those programmes. Uh, what that programme was, was take uh, reasonably vulnerable, shall we say, not toweringly intellectual working class kids, get them drunk, watch them misbehave, laugh at them, and hopefully along the way they'll have sex. Now, with a culture like that, are you that surprised that at least one of the presenters uh, stands accused of not behaving particularly well? I'm, I'm not surprised, Kevin, and I think your description of Big Brother there, um, that description could be applied to a number of programmes. Um, so, and, and I think that is a very serious problem. I think that in terms of the TV industry, I think more broadly, um, a number of our national broadcasters have a lot to answer for, Kevin. Uh, it, it seems to me there's scandal after scandal um, of, of very similar nature. Now, of course, as you say, Russell Brand denies all of these um, gravely serious allegations. But it does seem like, according to this uh, journalistic investigation, um, th there are a number of individuals who very much suggest that his immoral behaviour was very much a open secret, mm. that it was very well known uh, within the television industry. And I think that when you uh, look at other scandals involving the likes of Hugh Edwards and Peter Schofield... No, uh, Philip, Scho maybe... Philip Schofield. Philip, Philip, Philip Schofield, Schofield sorry. sorry, Philip Schofield. Um, th there'll be many people who may well suggest that <laughs> it's a really toxic culture um, within uh, television, which really needs to be addressed. Yeah. And there's been a fundamental lack of leadership, um, especially when it comes to our national broadcasters, mainstream channels, in terms of trying to root out that behaviour. Uh, and uh, what uh, they stand accused of, the executives who were running the independent production companies, Big Brother was made by a mm. company called Endemol, which was Endemol. subsequently bought by someone else. Uh, what they stand accused of, and the, and the terrestrial executives at the BBC and Channel 4, what they stand accused of is turning a blind eye uh, to not just Russell Brand's activities, but uh, uh, a lot of other stars. And what this is, in my view, Raki, the television industry has always suffered it, uh, from this, is an over-veneration of the people who present these shows and these people are treated like demigods and allowed to do mm. essentially what they want and one of the most disturbing allegations yeah, in this story from came from people who used to work on programs that he hosted they were you know researchers and producers and they said they were basically they allege they were basically reduced to the level of pimps, having to go through the studio audience and pick out the good-looking girls mm. so Russell uh, could uh, commune with them later. Uh, something very sick about the television industry. And I, I said earlier, think about some of the programmes they're, they're putting on now. They're still doing it. These, a lot of these reality shows are rancid and sick at heart. So you're married at first sight. Two people brought together, married, and guess what? Always ends up in uh, fisticuffs almost. The marriages that last about three weeks. Just for television entertainment, we attack the sanctity of marriage. Uh, and don't forget, there's also, among many other, there's Naked Attraction, uh, where people, uh, instead of uh, meeting and having a romance and then taking their clothes off, take their clothes off first and see how it works the other way around. And we can see them all in the nude on Channel 4. These programmes are just sort of... Horrible. No, absolutely. Uh, the reality is, is that much of the entertainment industry, it has a great deal of moral degeneracy at the heart of it. And I think you made a really good point earlier, Kevin, that many of these programmes, they tend to 
um, bring in individuals who are very clearly vulnerable. Yeah. Um, some, I suspect, would have had mental health issues before entering those programmes, before their involvement, uh, and, and to expose them in such a way in order to increase viewership um, in more recent times, to increase clicks on social yeah. media. I find it sickening, Kevin, if truth be told. Yeah, and uh, just to, before we move on, uh, in case you're in any doubt, I think it was Series 5, I remember, it, uh, there was a thing called Fight Night where the producers succeeded in working the contestants, the housemates, up into such a froth of fury and anger mm. that they all started fighting and the police had to be called. I mean, this shouldn't be happening on a television programme. And what did Channel 4 do about it? Nothing. They just carried on and made it worse. Uh, let's move on, though. Uh, let's talk about... Uh, actually, uh, the, the, Keir Starmer. Where do you think, uh, Rakib, he gets the idea that what the British people want is closer links with Europe? He's off to see Macron yesterday, uh, tomorrow, uh, to get closer ties with France. He went to The Hague last week with Yvette Cooper uh, to make some ridiculous speech that everybody thought was pathetic about the migrant crisis, uh, including begging the EU to do a deal with us uh, so we can take some of their migrants. Uh, uh, I mean, why do you think Starmer thinks that the people of Britain want closer ties with the EU? Well, I think that the real problem here is that Sir Keir Starmer continues to see Britain um, as a isolationist country, which is cut off from much of the rest of the international community. Which, firstly, it's it, not it true, is it? Not the case. Yeah. It's not the truth. It's not true. For example, he signed the Trilateral Security Pact, uh, Pact AUKUS, um, involving Australia and the United States. It's been one of the leading allies of Ukraine in relation to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. And I think that when you look at the rehoming of refugees, it's done a great deal of good when it comes when it's come to the resettlement of Ukrainians and Hong Kongers. So the idea that Britain has cut itself off from the rest of the international community in the post-Brexit world is utter nonsense, Kevin. And I think that now, of course, you can have that debate where you want to have constructive relations with a number of EU member states. I do think that in terms of the illegal migration crisis, there's no harm with, for example, the National Crime Agency in the UK yeah. developing stronger intelligence sharing ties yeah. with its counterparts in France, Germany and Belgium. But there's also a debate to be had in terms of how do we build ties within the Commonwealth, for example, a voluntary association of nations, 56 countries in various regions of the world. He doesn't seem to be talking about that at all. He's pigeonholing himself in terms of talking about these strengthened links with the EU, when I think that actually what we need to talk about is how having um, a constructive post-Brexit yeah. foreign policy yeah. which involves strategically important members in the Commonwealth. Yeah, I'd like to say, I'd like, since, since uh, um, he, uh, Keir seems to think we need a new deal, we've got to get a better deal, mm. I'd like to know what exactly is so bad about our current deal. Uh, because we're doing a hell of a lot better than Germany, arguably better than France, certainly better than Spain and Italy, and on and on it goes. So it looks to me as if Brexit hasn't been a bad thing for Britain. So quite why we want to get involved with that sclerotic, failing, dead pretty soon organisation, the EU, I don't know. But uh, let's uh, regroup after these messages. Rakib, I'm talking to Rakib Essen, social policy analyst and writer. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. This is Talk TV, live from the Talk Radio studio. Studios.